Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for, for coming on this Friday. Uh, I know we're in the middle of a, kind of the pandemic, so maybe this is um, some sort of uh, uh, some sort of entertainment for a Friday evening. Um, I'll try to keep it as light as possible, but obviously with the situation we found us, I find ourselves in in 2020, I will also try to do our current plight the justice that it deserves. So. Uh, I'll start tonight by introducing myself and then I'll give you a brief rundown of why I started Food Facts and then I'll get into why I believe that everyone that can become vegan or at the very least plant-based has the absolute imperative to do so. So my name is Simon Wally. I'm 42 years old and I'm originally from Wales in the UK. I've been living in Asia for the past 20 years uh, in the Philippines, Taiwan, Vietnam and since 2003 I've called Japan my home. My family have moved all around Japan from Hokkaido to the Ogasawara Islands to Yamanashi to Kyoto to Hiroshima and Kumamoto and we are now living on a small island in the Seto Sea. Uh, a few years ago uh, we started a website called Food Facts that aims to translate news and scientific articles about uh, the impact of animal agriculture into Japanese. That is why I'm talking to you tonight. Uh, coinciding roughly with the birth of my son Indy in 2011, I became aware first of the looming problems of climate change and biodiversity loss. And then the more I learned, uh, the more I guess obsessed uh, with these problems I became. Uh, over the past 10 years, things have gotten progressively worse and climate change is no longer called climate change, but the climate crisis or emergency. So I'll tell you briefly about my journey to veganism before I get into the facts about why I think we all need to consider veganism as a matter of urgency. Uh, coming from Wales, which is a pretty meat obsessed country where the norm is to eat a breakfast of sausages, bacon, eggs and milky tea. I was a standard meat eater. Um, everything I ate had animal products in it. If I had a curry, there was chicken in it. If I had pasta, probably ham or sausage not putting animal food parts in my food was weird, uh, very, very weird. On my travels, uh, I have tried uh, whale, snake, and uh, to my horror, I even ate uh, man's best friend uh, in my early 20s when I was in Korea. I didn't see the problem with this because I considered all animals equal, but humans not so, I guess. Uh, at least I was consistent. Then in 2010, my wife and I settled in for a uh, Saturday night movie. And that night's movie was to be a life-changing one. It was the uh, Joaquin Phoenix narrated Earthlings documentary. Neither my wife or I remember why or how we came across this documentary, but we're both extremely glad that we did. Um, until this moment, I would, like I think most standard meat eaters, have considered us animal lovers. I was appalled at animal abuse that I read about uh, in newspapers or saw on the TV, but I always considered this abuse to be the act of individuals. Um, Earthlings opened my eyes to the systemic abuse that's commonplace in factory farms, fur farms, animal testing, and to a certain extent, zoos. I could no longer contribute to the absolute torture that is factory farming. I couldn't in good conscience continue to hope for world peace uh, when I had the body parts of dead animals on my plate. Animals you know, don't chop themselves up uh, on our behalf. Uh, I wasn't a violent person, so paying other people to perpetuate violence wasn't something I could continue to do. The very next day, we ate our last land-based animal. Yes, we ate one more, sorry. Uh, we became pescatarians. Uh, my wife was six months pregnant at the time, and we didn't know much about vegan nutrition, so we decided to opt for a temporary life of inconsistency. We were now eating fish, eggs, and cheese. As my son grew up, and I researched more and more about the environment, I became more and more concerned for his future. Uh, unfortunately, I felt very helpless to do anything about it. Um, obviously, completely overhauling the economic system was a little out of my league. Then in 2015, I became aware of a new documentary called Cowspiracy. 
Once again, Cowrie and I settled in for movie night and once again, the movie changed our lives. The next day we became vegan. It had taken me 37 years, but it was one of the greatest decisions of my life. Um, so what was it in the documentary that inspired this change? Mostly it was that this was something I could do uh, that would actually have an impact, however small on a global scale. I, at last I could see some hope in a desperate situation. I looked uh, into the greenhouse gas emissions, the deforestation, the wildlife loss, the ocean dead zones, the ocean plastic and the water use that were caused by animal agriculture. It's fair to say uh, I was blown away. You might think that I was depressed, but uh, I wasn't. Um, it, it actually gave me hope. I was worried about the climate emergency and this uh, gave me some hope. If we move to plant-based diets, I thought, we will be a long way to dealing with the problems we face. Then I started talking to people about what I knew. Very quickly, my hope turned to despair. People laughed and joked that, you know, they could never give up meat. Never, not in your life, if your life depended on it, never. I was astonished and bewildered. Uh, I told them that animal agriculture was responsible for more than 90% of animal deforestation. I told them that animal agriculture was the second biggest cause of deforestation globally. I told them that animal agriculture was responsible for 18% of greenhouse gas emissions and that according to World Watch, that figure was a massive underestimate. And that when you figuring uh, other factors like deforestation, the actual figure was closer to 51%. Uh, I told everyone I could that 45% of the Earth's surface is used for animal agriculture. I told them that 27% of fresh water is given to farmed animals while millions of humans go thirsty. I think I might even have mentioned that a staggering 60% of all species loss is caused by uh, our addiction to eating the flesh of other animals. I told them that because of uh, a lack of regulations on food grown for non-human animals, that pesticides were destroying our soil, that we only have 60 harvests left if we don't radically change our agricultural systems. I told them that we uh, shouldn't be focusing on uh, banning plastic straws to protect our oceans. If we want to protect our oceans, uh, we need to stop fishing. 46% of the plastic in our oceans is from the fishing industry. I told them that uh, for every pound of fish caught, uh, five pounds of life are taken. That includes whales, uh, dolphins, turtles, seabirds, and sharks. I told them that uh, people, uh, that the chemical runoff from an animal agriculture was not only poisoning our rivers and lakes, but also our oceans. We are creating massive dead zones uh, around the world from nitrogen and phosphorus runoff from factory farms. I even told people that uh, by 2048, uh, scientists are predicting that the oceans will be empty of fish uh, if we carry on with industrial fishing. People remained uh, unaffected, at least on the surface. I started to get a little dejected, I'll be honest. As the climate crisis came closer into view, dejected is an understatement. I was exacerbated and frustrated. I could understand why we would continue to eat animals if we needed to for our health, that would be an absolute bummer. You know, if we had to continue with animal agriculture or we would all die, but if we continued with animal agriculture, we would all die anyway. Now, wow, what a bummer that would be. But fortunately, we don't have such a catch-22 scenario. We don't need to eat animals to be healthy. In fact, what I found was that plant-based diets are actually extremely healthy. In fact, whilst the number one cause of death in developed countries is not from terrorists or gun crime. It's actually from heart disease. That's what's killing people today. And heart disease in the vegan community is largely unheard of. Another of the major killers is cancer. And whilst, uh, again, cancer is not unheard of in the vegan community, the likelihood of vegans getting cancer is far less than that of the purveyors of animal flesh or their secretions. I banged on to parents that feeding their kids processed 
uh, processed meat is increasing their risk of colon cancer by 18%. That was a funny one. People laughed at that one. And that is from the World Health Organization. Uh, they also said that red meat was a probable carcinogen. Feeding children food that definitely causes cancer, not something in my own humble opinion that we should be doing. According to researchers at Adelaide University, the prevalence of meat availability is also equal to sugar when it comes to obesity. We have an epidemic that is going viral and meat consumption is playing a key role. Of course, I told people how cruel it was to do what we are doing to 70 billion farmed animals every year. I quoted the great uh, Noval Har uh, Yuval Noah Harari who said that factory farming may well turn out to be the greatest crime in history. But I met a wall of silence uh, of either uh, excuses like God said this or we've always done it and it's natural. It was frustrating to say the least and it still is. We are facing the end of uh, our species and people refuse to even consider changing their diets. Uh, how do you deal with that realization that people around you who share offices with you, homes with you, lives with you, laugh with you, but they will not change their diets to ensure that your son and their children have a chance in life. That's, it's really tough, but uh, it's not as tough as life is for other non-human animals. So I guess we need to put that into perspective. Things are slowly changing in other developed nations. Uh, in my own country of the UK, flexitarianism is massively on the rise, but obviously this isn't veganism. Um, but from my own experience, you're much more likely to become vegan once you have tasted the other side and you realize that it's actually bloody good. According to the data, uh, one in four people you bump into in the UK will be vegan by 2025 and half will be flexitarian. Australia and the US are following similar trends. So. Why is Japan lagging so far behind? Especially as this is a country that uh, used, that, that was largely vegetarian until Commodore Perry arrived. Uh, the answer to me is that the media remain completely uh, silent about uh, the state of the earth and the impact that animal agriculture is wreaking on our ecosystems. When I speak to people in English, um, I can show them numerous articles and scientific studies to support my claims. But when I speak in Japanese, I always have to, have to point to art in articles in English, mostly out of reach of English speaking Japanese. This, this is why I wanted to make food facts. Um, I wanted to have a resource that people like myself could use to help Japanese people to understand why we not should be vegan, but why we must be. So with the help of my wife, Kauri, and some amazing dedicated supporters, we built Food Facts and began translating articles into Japanese so that people here had the information they needed to make uh, educated decisions. Food Facts launched in autumn 2018, and we have had over 43,000 visits since then. Uh, we hope with, that with your support, we can reach even more people. Unfortunately, since uh, Food Facts was launched, things uh, on planet Earth have gotten progressively worse. And without massive changes, they will continue on a downward spiral. So that was my motivation for becoming vegan and also starting Food Facts. Now I want to take a look at where we find ourselves in 2020. And in doing so, I hope to convince you of the need to become vegan or at least plant-based. Uh, 2020 has been a year to forget. Mass lockdowns, hysteria over wearing a simple piece of cotton uh, over your mouth, a crashed economy and 55 million people infected with COVID-19 and more than 1.34 million deaths worldwide. The panic of pandemic is still ongoing and as the winter months close in we can expect many more thousands of people to lose their, li to lose their lives around the world. In our post-truth society, many people simply refuse to accept that the virus is real and nurses are telling stories about patients on their deathbeds as they die from COVID-19 saying that the virus isn't real. This cannot be happening to me. Well, it is happening. People are dying and this disease would not have happened in a vegan world. 
A very bold statement, I know, but one I think I can back up with facts. Coronaviruses are zoonotic diseases, which means they originate in animals and are passed to humans where they mutate. This particular virus originated uh, in a wet market in Wuhan, China. It is not surprising, given the disgusting, squalid conditions at these west ma wet markets, and the global community is right to want them banned completely. Where the global community, in my opinion, is wrong is to point the blame squarely at China, uh, as if China is the only country on the planet where animals are forced to live in constant fear, pain, and filthy conditions. No, since 1920s America, first with chickens and then with pigs, and more recently uh, cows, animals have been forced off their land and into dark, dingy cages or barns. A simple Google search or a visit to Animal Rights Center uh, will be enough to prove what I am saying. Animals forced to live their entire lives uh, in their own feces, never to feel grass underneath or sun on their skin until the day they get driven to their deaths, where they are killed in dirty slaughterhouses covered in the blood of thousands of animals that died in immensely stressed conditions as they cried out for their lives. This is not hyperbole. Uh, I have left out the worst parts of what happens to these systematically abused animals. The daily beatings, the tail dockings, the beaks being cut off, the teeth being removed, all without anesthesia. Human beings used to be omnivores. We used to kill animals for survival. Today, we kill and torture, uh, torture and kill animals for culinary pleasure. Is it, having heard this, is it therefore surprising to find that 75% of new or emerging infectious diseases originate in animals. Just take a look at the diseases which have emerged uh, in the last 100 years. We had the Spanish flu, which originated in donkeys. HIV came from primates, Ebola from bats, Nipah was passed from bats to pigs, SARS from bats to civets, MERS from bats to camels, avian flu from wild birds to poultry, and swine flu from pigs. In fact, while the world has been focusing closely on COVID-19, there have been multiple outbreaks of avian flu and more alarmingly, multiple outbreaks of swine flu on multiple continents. While avian flu is not seen as deadly as swine flu, as COVID-19, swine flu has the potential to pass from pigs to humans where it can mutate and then back to pigs where it once again mutates before passing back to humans. Uh, even, even if vaccines could be developed in record time, the virus may have mutated beyond control and new vaccines would be needed again and again. These diseases are completely avoidable. Keeping animals in cages in stressful, crowded conditions is a recipe for infectious disease. If we were to keep uh, thousands upon thousands of human animals in dirty warehouses where they lived in their own waste. We gave them next to zero medical attention and they fought each other through frustration and stress. Would we be surprised to find a disease spreading? Of course not. We would expect it. Animals and human animals are not that different. When people in the West demand that China closes its wet markets, where is the conversation around banning factory farms and slaughterhouses, slaughterhouses. These diseases will continue to come at us and destroy livelihoods and cause deaths until we, the way, we change the way that we treat animals. They are simply a result of our lack of respect and empathy for all non-human animals. As if things couldn't be any worse, animal agriculture is here to strike again. Around 80% of the antibiotics sold globally are fed to healthy farmed animals. Rather than provide animals with space and a little comfort, animals in factory farms are fed a constant diet of antibiotics to prevent disease outbreaks and promote faster growth. Feeding antibiotics to healthy animals is not the smartest thing we could do. Bacteria learn on the job to resist antibiotics, and it is possible if we continue that medicine will return to the dark ages. 2020 has been playing out uh, with the pandemic as a backdrop. But 
there is a much larger and more worrying situation playing out. And it is much harder to get people to focus on it than the infectious disease that is impacting us uh, right now. So let me move on to a much more concerning problem. We're in the middle of the sixth extinction. Species are going extinct at a thousand times the baseline rate. Not since the dinosaurs went extinct 66 million years ago has there been a mass extinction. Three quarters of life on Earth disappeared then. And in a massive stroke of luck for humans, this extinction event allowed mammals to flourish. The dinosaurs roamed the, roamed the Earth for millions of years. Humans, on the other hand, have only been around for a few hundred thousand years. In that time, and more importantly, since the Industrial Revolution, humans have impacted the planet massively. We have filled the oceans with plastic, killed off most of the large megafauna, cut down vast forests, and polluted the rivers, air, and oceans. Today, humans and the farmed animals we keep for food make up 96% of the total weight of mammals. Uh, wildlife accounts for just 4%. Likewise, 70% of all birds are kept for human use, while just 30% are free to fly. A change in our diets can reverse this very quickly, uh, this shocking trend. The last few years have been hard to watch. We have seen vicious uh, storms batter into coast. We have seen droughts envelope large swathes of Africa, uh, Australia, America, and South Asia. We have seen record flooding we have seen a return of biblical plagues of locusts who are destroying crops in Africa. America, Russia, Alaska, and Australia have been on fire. Millions of animals perished in Australia as the government continues to downplay the threat of the climate emergency. We have seen heat waves on every single continent and records are tumbling everywhere we look. The droughts and natural disasters we are witnessing around the world uh, are driving migration. Since 2008, 161 countries have experienced environmental disasters, which have led to the displacement of people. Between 2008 and 2013, an average of 350,000 people sought entry to the EU each year because of environmental disasters. This seems like a lot of people until you consider that this number could rise to 200 million when the full impacts of climate change are felt. The UN's IPCC 2018 report highlighted that 350 million people would be exposed to drought at 1.5 degrees of warming and a further 60 million if the temperature is allowed to rise by two degrees. Extreme weather and uh, sea level and the sea level rise uh, will add to the number of people on the march in the coming decades. And people in rich countries will have to tackle the ethical decision of what we do to help. Due to our high emissions and comfortable lives, we have created this problem for people in the global south. Will we now accept them into our homes or will we leave them to die? Will we build bridges or will we build walls? So far, we have looked at the situation around the world today. We've seen the extreme weather events, the droughts, the wildfires, the floods, and the weather caused migrations. What of our combined futures? In 2018, the, two, the, the governmental, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reported that we must cut emissions from uh, 2010 levels by 45% by 2030 to have any chance of staying within a temperature rise of 1.5 degrees since the Industrial Revolution. The carbon budget we have does not allow us to burn much more fossil fuels or we will no longer be able to prevent runaway climate change. On our present trajectory, having already emitted almost 38 gigatons of carb, uh, greenhouse gases and growing, we have only until 2030 before we exceed the 420 gigaton carbon uh, CO2 limit to stay within 1.5 degrees. And that only gives us a 66% chance of doing so. If we don't meet this target and continue on our current path, then the probability of successfully staying within 1.5 degrees drops with every gigaton of carbon emitted. If we emit 580 gigatons of carbon, then our chances drop to only 50-50. The question we need to ask ourselves here is would we put our children on a plane with only a 66% chance of landing? 50% less? 
We all know the answer to this question, but that is exactly what we're doing by continuing business as usual. These are some of the impacts we will see uh, in a two degrees warmer world compared to that of a, a 1.5 degree world. Twice as many people will be exposed to water scarcity. 1.7 times more people will be impacted by floods. 60 million more people will face drought conditions. The extra 10 centimeters of extra sea level rise will impact 145 million more people. The amount of Arctic sea ice will be 10 times less in summer. 99% of coral will disappear. 50% more habitat will be lost. Twice as many invertebrates will become extinct. And 37% of the world's population will be exposed to extreme heat days. Again, we need to ask ourselves, are we okay with this? If the answer is no, then we must act immediately to prevent it from happening. Unfortunately, our leaders, uh, it seems, are more than okay with this happening. Uh, in response to the IPCC calls for 45% reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, former Prime Minister Abe offered to cut emissions by 26%. That's just over half what the IPCC says it's necessary to avoid the conditions I just highlighted. What kind of a person decides it is okay to allow these things to happen? As typhoons and floods kill dozens in Japan, the leader of our country was intent on making matters worse which will without doubt result in many more deaths in Japan and around the world in the coming years. That isn't the worst of it. According to the Japan Times, uh, Japan is only on course to deliver 7% cuts by the 2030 deadline. This behavior cannot and should not be acceptable to us. It will result in the deaths and forced migration of potentially hundreds of millions of people and the extinction of many species. This is not what leaders are supposed to do. They are supposed to provide safety to their citizens. A failure to provide this safety results in the social contract being broken. We give up some of our freedoms in exchange for security. The government is ensuring our safety will be threatened with its wholly inadequate response to this crisis. As people lost lives, Prime Minister Abe sent his thoughts and prayers. We do not need thoughts and prayers. We need the government to act immediately to stop dangerous levels of warming and the ensuing chaos it will bring. Finally, after Abe's exit, Prime Minister Suga accepted the need to become carbon neutral by 2050. And yesterday, the government announced a climate emergency. This is a really positive step forward, but we don't have until 2050 to deal with this problem. It's an emergency and we need to act now. The very least that is necessary is the 45% IPC cuts by, the, by 2030, which the Japanese government have not mentioned at all. So let's look at the chaos. Uh, this lack of action will uh, unleash on our planet. With our current policies, we are heading for a three to 3.4 degree warmer world by 2100. Just imagine what this will look like. The storms, floods, wildfires, and floods we are witnessing at one degree of warming multiplied by three. A report by Earth League researchers states we have a 10% chance of exceeding six degrees. Is this the world that we want our children and grandchildren to inhabit? Japan may be 4.6 degrees hotter by 2100. Temperatures are on course to rise well over three degrees by the end of the century. And this is without factoring in the carbon bomb in the Arctic. Um, that could uh, possibly double that figure. At just three degrees of warming, scientists predict that major cities like New York, uh, Miami, Shanghai, and even London will go underwater. Asia will be worst hit, with Tokyo facing annual flooding by 2050. Kumamoto faces a uh, being submerged every year. And Hiroshima will be completely inundated. Nagoya's citizens face a very difficult uh, future. And as most Japanese people live on the coasts, uh, of its crowded 30,000 kilometer coastline. This coastline is about to be uh, redrawn. You can see here 
Osaka today and next Osaka at three degrees of warming. At just one meter of sea level rise, Japan will lose 90.3% of its beaches. Sea levels are expected to rise by at least two meters by 2100, and 46% of Japanese will be affected. We will likely hit two degrees of warming by mid-century, and while the seas will take longer to rise, rise they will. Once we lock them in, they will not be stopped. 47% of in industrial output is at risk, and over a trillion dollars in assets will be vulnerable. Japan is part of a group of countries that can expect to see sea level rise of between 10 and 20% higher than the global average. Another effect of a warming planet is that more moisture is evaporated. This is already resulting in droughts all across our planet from Australia to Sudan to Somalia to California. Today, around 40% of the population uh, live are affected by water scarcity. And by 2030, 700 million people will be forced to leave their homes because of drought. The maps on the next slide show some current and future water stress in parts of the world. Within five years, much of India will face water scarcity. Pakistan faces a similar situation. A lack of food and water will likely exacerbate tensions between these two nuclear armed neighbors. The problem of water scarcity is not limited to South Asia. Iraq, which is already suffering after two US-led wars, a decade of US-led sanctions and terrorist violence, will see water stress double in many areas. Likewise, Iran, Syria, Kuwait, and Saudi Arabia will see water stress increase significantly. There is enormous tension in these area countries already. But with the added drought and a lack of food, tensions are likely to rise dramatically. North Africa will also be badly affected by drought with Morocco hit hardest, but Algeria and Libya are also expected to see water stress increase by 1.4 times. These countries are stopping points on many refugees journeys from sub-Saharan Africa to Europe, but water shortages and food insecurity may also lead to people from these countries heading across the Mediterranean in search of safety. Their closest route is across the Strait of Gibraltar, uh, to Spain. Unfortunately, Spain will also be suffering from a lack of water, with most of the country expected to be 1.4 times more water stressed by 2040. Much of Latin America, including large sections of Mexico and Brazil, and regions bordering the Mediterranean Sea, could also become especially dry. Large parts of Southwest Asia, most of Africa, and Australia will see particularly dry conditions. Southeast Asia, including parts of China and neighboring countries, will also be badly affected. Now, Japan might not suffer from these drought-like conditions, although Tokyo is one of 11 projected cities to run out of water in the coming decades, largely due to Tokyo's rainfall coming in just four months uh, of the year. The largest problem for Japan is food insecurity. Like many developed countries, Japan's self-sufficiency has been decreasing sharply over the last 50 years. In 2018, due to the climate, due to the climate caused storms that ravaged the country, Japan relied on other countries for 63% of its calorific intake. When other countries are affected by drought and can no longer guarantee food for their populations, they will be unable to export food. This could lead to a huge shortfall in the amount of food Japan is able to import. As we have seen, these water shortages will begin in the next decade. One area where Japan will be hit hard is heavier rainfall. Uh, this will increase in strength and frequency in the coming years. Japan is projected to see an increase in mean precipitation of by more than 10% this century, with summer rainfall expected to rise by 17 to 19%. Hokkaido will see an increase in heavy rain events and typhoons will also increase in severity and frequency. More rainfall will lead to more mudslides like those which have killed dozens in the past five years. This increase in rainfall and typhoon strength is due to warming oceans. Warming oceans lead to more evaporation and more moisture in the atmosphere, which leads to more rainfall. Since 1900 typhoons, and 1990 typhoons, which have hit East and Southeast Asia, have intensified by 12 to 15%. The number of the larger category four and five storms has also doubled in that period, and in some places tripled. Their destructive power has also increased 
by 50%. Metropolises across Asia can expect to see super strength typhoons barrel through, raising infrastructure losses from $3 trillion in 2005 to $35 trillion in 2070. The main concern we should all have is food production. With an increase in probability of uh, increased rainfall or droughts, crops will be affected. If you have a storm, it might destroy the crop. You can't grow again for a year. If you have a drought, it may kill the crop. You can't grow for another year. If you have floods, they may kill the crop. You can't grow again for a year. You can see where this heads us. In the coming decades, it is going to be harder and harder for, to grow food and the population is going to continue to expand. The, the climate crisis is part of a wider ecological problem, including the sixth mass extinction. Uh, human actions since 1970 have led to the deaths of 60% of animal populations. This is largely due to the loss of habitat, the use of pesticides and other chemicals. And by the middle of this century, scientists are predicting that half of all, all known species could go extinct. A staggering 60% of these losses could be reversed if we could make the change to a plant-based diet. That's the amount that the World Wildlife Fund states is caused by eating meat. Depending on the number of species on our planet, species loss uh, is believed to be between 1,000 and 10,000 times the natural extinction rate. If there are 2 million different species on Earth, then we are witnessing between 200 and 2,000 extinctions per year. If there are, as many predict, 100 million different species, then we are losing between 10,000 and 100,000 species a year. The high end of that figure means we are losing 273 species every single day. We are all aware of the plight of tigers, polar bears, pandas and whales, but these are just the most visible losses. The world will be a terrible, sad, terribly sad place without them. We have lived side by side since the dawn of our species. We have grown up with them. Their names are among the first things we say as children. We learn to draw them before drawing humans. They are part of us. However, from a pragmatic perspective, it is the smaller and less attractive creatures that humans will miss the most. Out of the, mo out of the 100 crops, uh, crop species that provide us with 90% of our food, 35% are pollinated by bees, birds, and bats. Due to human activity, including our excessive use of pesticides and incesticides, bee, bird, and bat populations are declining rapidly. Honeybees alone pollinate around $170 billion worth of crops worldwide. From April 1st, 2018 to April 1st, 2019, the, ma the managed bee population fell by 40.7%. Some areas have even seen 90% declines. Insects are slowly going extinct. 40% uh, of insect species are declining and a third are endangered. This extinction is eight times faster than that of mammals, birds, and reptiles. Insect populations are declining at an astonishing 2.5% a year. They could vanish from the face of this earth uh, before the century is out at these current rates. The soil under our feet is also dying. Uh, 30 soccer fields of soil are lost every minute, largely due to intensive farming. Topsoil takes a thousand years to generate three centimeters and all the world's topsoil could be gone by 2074. Earthworms play an important part in generating topsoil as their feces enrich the soil and shallow dwelling earthworms open pathways for air and water. Unfortunately, earthworms are slowly disappearing from the soil under our farmland after excessive overuse of chemicals. 42% of fields in England now have a scarcity or absence of surface dwelling and deep burrowing worms. All of the information, including in this presentation, leads us to a frightening place in human uh, history. A fast increasing population expected to hit 10 billion uh, by 2050, less land, less food, less water, more disease, more extreme weather, floods, droughts, and storms. Several reports uh, in 2019 uh, claimed that civil society could collapse within decades due to food shortages 
and conflict. These reports are not coming from left-leaning environmentalists my, like myself. They are increasingly coming from former fossil fuel executives like Ian Dunlop and the Pentagon. In 2017, 17 retired uh, military officers sent a letter to US Secretary of State Rex Tillerson claiming climate change poses strategically significant risks to US national security directly impacting our critical infrastructure and increasing the likelihood of humanitarian disasters, state failure and conflict. A further Pentagon report in 2019 claimed that the US military could collapse within 20 years due to climate change. The report titled Implications of Climate Change for the US Army stated that global starvation, war, disease, drought and a fragile power grid could have cascading, devastating effects. What Al Gore called the inconvenient truth uh, has been laid out before us here. It is frightening. We are right to be frightened. After coming to terms with our alarming predicament, fear and anxiety are natural responses. This fear has been termed eco-anxiety. But I'm not here today to send you into a wild depression. There is no point in being depressed. I'm here today to give you an opportunity to stop these things from happening. If you look at the title of these reports, you will see the use of could and if. These reports are not saying that there is going to be societal breakdown. They are warning us that unless we change course, this will be our future. Our elected officials have been compl complacent at best and complicit in the possible deaths of hundreds of millions and then billions at worst. The number of people who will die from climate, the climate crisis and ecological breakdown will dwarf the number of people Stalin, Hitler or Mao killed. We are looking at the possible extinction of the majority of species on the planet, including our own. Are we going to stay silent as our governments and corporations continue to push us over this ecological cliff face? Or are we going to act like we're in a crisis because we are actually in a crisis? These are the things that we can do. Of course, there are many things that climate scientists are advising us uh, to do. I've taken a selection here, and they include reducing or eliminating flights, reducing consumption, taking public transportation or riding a bike, saving water, and of course, eating a plant-based diet. But the most important thing is actually to talk about the problem. Way too many people are ignoring the reality uh, of the situation. It seems they would rather leave the problems to someone else than look at the part that they play in the problem and also in solving the emergency. Politicians would rather we invent some uh, technology that magically allows us to carry on as normal. Uh, to them, they would rather see giant umbrellas covering Earth uh, than alter the economic system that relies on constant growth. What is sure is that we must hurriedly stop increasing CO2 levels, and we must also remove CO2 from the atmosphere, about 12.5% to be precise. Now, business as usual proponents would like machines to do this job of carbon removal, and it all sounds very nice and warm and fuzzy until you look at the uh, research that says that these machines actually produce more CO2 than they remove. A much more feasible way to remove the CO2 is to plant trillions of trees, uh, which would then suck the carbon out of the atmosphere and turn it into oxygen that we can breathe. This would have the added benefit of providing habitat for millions of species facing extinction because we've cut the trees down in the first place. There are more solutions like protecting mangroves and peat bogs, but they don't make a profit, so they are largely ignored. These natural solutions are the way forward for one huge reason. They actually work. We know they work. We can start right now and they help to fix both climate and biodiversity crises, not just the one. Unfortunately, there is one glitch with these natural solutions. We need to change our diets. Without transitioning to plant rich diets, we won't be able to free up enough land for tree planting. Uh, it simply will not work. A move to plant-based diets could reduce land use by 75% and free up uh, areas the size of the US, China, the EU and Australia combined. 
There is an excellent project called Project Drawdown, and uh, they are the only team of their kind that is looking across the board at all possible solutions. And their plan works at stopping first and then removing carbon from our atmosphere. They have priced the solutions and estimated the amount of carbon that can be removed with each solution. Of the top five solutions, number one is onshore uh, wind turbines, and number two is utility scale solar panels. Number three is reducing food waste, and number four is a plant-rich diet. Unless you have a lot of money, the first two solutions are down to government. Reducing food waste can be tackled by farmers, and it can also be uh, at the supply side and supermarkets also. It can also be tackled by consumers at the demand side. We can all make sure that we use all the food we buy. It won't cost us anything. It will actually save us money. When it comes to the plant-rich diets, we can all start this with our next meal. Uh, if we cook the meal ourselves, it will also save us money. Vegan food has a reputation for being expensive, but this is simply not true. Beans and lentils, which are high in protein, are the cheapest protein source around. We all listen to infectious disease experts when it comes to wearing masks and social distancing. So I hope we can start to listen to the climate scientists when it comes to the climate crisis. If we are to survive on this planet, then we need to transition to plant-based diets as soon as possible. I hope I have made a strong case tonight uh, for why we need to start transitioning to vegan lifestyles from the destruction of our forests and oceans and the rise of pandemics to the lack of empathy we see in society, we wholeheartedly need to accept veganism as one of the greatest answers to our interconnected problems. At present, we teach children to respect, uh, sorry, teaching children to respect all life uh, will lead to a much more harmonious existence than we have at present. We currently teach children that discrimination and bullying of the weak is acceptable. And then we wonder why we have so much anger and discrimination in society. For the sake of our home, our health, and our evolution, I believe we should make a, a vegan world. Thank you for listening.